I began covering McCain probably in the mid-1990s. And at the time, some friends and I, Bill Kristol and some others, were trying to relaunch the Republican Party, maybe with a little more progressive direction. And we had something called National Greatness Conservatism, which was really descended from Alexander Hamilton and Abraham Lincoln, and especially Teddy Roosevelt. And we were looking for a sort of reforming conservative of that sort. It was not libertarian, but pretty conservative, liked business, liked immigration, tough on foreign policy, idealistic democracy promotion abroad. And McCain fit the bill in every way. And so it was really, at first, an intellectual attraction, just the way he conducted himself with the senator and the things he stood for. And I began to get to know some of the people on the staff, and then I got to know him. And we really saw him as the future of the Republican Party. Ideologically, McCain has moved around. Uh, he was, he's primarily, I think, an honor-driven person. And so when I first got to know him, he was driven by uh, a sense that something dishonorable was going on, whether it was a corruption at Boeing, whether it was the campaign finance system. He was really a missile that aimed itself at anything dishonorable. So I wouldn't say there was a broad overarching philosophy, but he was always a reformer. He always liked the idea that we've got to reform this, reform that. Uh, and at that time, I think he was, he was trending more moderate, uh, more uh, of a center right, uh, more of a, using government to do good things, for, but being for the market. I think when he began running for president the second time, uh, and as he got closer to the nomination, he became a more orthodox Republican. Uh, and that led to the selection of Sarah Palin. And then I think in the last couple of years, he's trended back to what I think of as his true self. And a lot of that might have been driven by politics. A lot of that, I think he got disillusioned with some of the people who were supporting him in before and liked the fact that he was getting supported by the, the top of the, of the Republican Party. Uh, and so he, he drifted right, for sure, uh, as the party drifted right, and as he wanted to lead it. Uh, now, in, his, uh, in these later days, He's drifted back to the honor-driven guy um, who is just disgusted by, um, by over-ideologization and the libertarian free market tide that has taken over the party. Yeah, well, stubborn is the word. <laughs> you know, a lot of us like to be unpopular in our workplace. And I've seen McCain uh, be unpopular time and time again. Sometimes for excellent reasons, sometimes for not great reasons. But he's a man who is um, driven by his own convictions. And I would say he's one of the few politicians I've ever covered who has an authentic inner voice. Even when he does things that are not great, uh, embracing the Confederate flag while running for in South Carolina, he knows he's not doing something great. Most politicians I cover, they rationalize it to themselves, and so there's no honest interior voice there. But whether it was the POW experience or whatever, or some other cause, McCain has never been able to lie to himself very well. And so even when he compromises for political reasons, he knows he's compromising some piece of himself, and I think there's some piece of himself that feels pretty bad about it. I think it, it comes from his dad and from his granddad and from his mom. Uh, they fiercely, he, he grew up with a moral code, uh, and it was a code that preached honor and glory, sacrifice for country, and the stories he tells on the camp tra pain trail, he tells more stories about other people's heroism than any other politician I've ever covered. They're all about that kind of honor and glory. And it's really a Roman and Greek moral system. The idea is that we, we should s strive for eternal fame and be worthy of fame not just fame in the low sense, but be worthy of honorable fame, because we did something big for the country. And whether that's in the prison, or whether that's uh, in the realm of politics. And for somebody with a Roman and Greek honor code, public service is the highest calling. And I think that's why he's devoted his life to that. McCain had a style of politics, which I think was a Teddy Roosevelt style of politics. If traditional liberals believe in big government to enhance equality, and traditional conservatives, Republicans, believe in shrinking government to enhance freedom, McCain stood for this Roosevelt idea, limited but energetic government to enhance social mobility. And so he was willing to use government to smash up the oligarchies that were keeping people down, that, would, that were stifling people's ability to become capitalists. And so he, was, he would 
be capable of using government, whether it was to combat global warming or something else. So he was never a liberal, but he was never a no government conservative. And so pieces, people saw pieces of him on both sides. He's not always authentic, but he's more authentic than everybody else. Uh, and, I, you know, he's personable. When I would ride around him in the 2000, the 2000 presidential campaign was the most fun I've ever had as a political journalist. We would get in the van, and he would do events, say, in South Carolina. You want to hit three media markets every day. So we'd get in the van. We'd ride with him in the morning to an event, get back in the van, ride across the state to another event, get back in the van, another state to an event. And everything was transparent. He had no money. And so he needed us to broadcast everything. And we were sitting there throughout the campaign, right? They were planning the ads. They were writing the speeches. They were talking about the strategy. And some of us journalists were just sitting there. So we got to see absolutely everything. And he was completely honest and open. Uh, and, you know, the, the, I figured in those rides, the way to get McCain talking was to find somebody he didn't like and uh, just remind him of it. And so you'd get it at like 6 in the morning in a van, and he'd say, we can't, Senator, did you see what Rick Santorum said? He'd go, ah, oh, And then he'd go off, and his tooth, his mouth would just go. And he'd talk and talk and talk, and who he didn't like, who he did like, uh, and it was great. We got to see absolutely everything. And then later, after he got real momentum, some journalists came in who didn't know how to deal with McCain, and so they were, they were doing, trying to do all these gotcha questions, and they put him on the defensive, and he would begin to close down. But if you were just willing to ride the circus and have fun with him, then he was the best show I've ever covered. You know, I think McCain easily could have won in 2000. Uh, he had this huge New Hampshire, and then we got to South Carolina, and he had all the momentum on his side. He was the fresh face. Uh, he had the whole media on his side. We were his base. Uh, and then what happened in South Carolina, which was the pivotal state there, was that Bush and some of his people did some dirty tricks. And there were some, some allegations about race. And McCain and his people, John Weaver and Mark Salter, I think they took it too personally. They decided something really disgraceful and dishonorable was being done, and they had to hit back. And they hit back too rashly, and sometimes in a way that seemed to assault the entire Republican Party, and sometimes seemed to insult a lot of the key, especially some of the evangelical figures. And so I think their sense of honor and courage was riled up. And I think they lost a little of that control. And of course, that's always the problem if you're going to campaign like McCain. Very instinctual, seat of the pants. As somebody said, McCain is not the guy driving the aircraft carrier. He's the guy in the plane alone, flying the plane off and onto the aircraft carrier. And that's, a, that's just a lone wolf kind of operation. And so it's all instinctual. And I think they got their instincts a little out of whack in the heat of battle. And I think if they had kept on track, I think he had the superior vision, uh, he had all the momentum. Uh, I, think he could have, um, I think he could have won that nomination. You know, we all have the one virtue we aspire to most. Um, for some of us, believe it or not, you know, for me, I'm a pundit. Humility is the one I'd like to possess. For McCain, it's courage. Uh, courage is the essential trait. It's what he's written books about. Uh, and if you're going to be a soldier or a fighter or a pilot, that's the courage you need. And so he admires courage in others, and he insists upon it on himself. And courage comes in many forms, the kind he displayed in Vietnam, but also intellectual courage. Uh, and moral courage in politics, because the demands to compromise and to get along with everybody else are just insistent. And to be able to stand up when the winds are blowing in your face and when it's going to cost you is a very, um, it's a s seductive form of compromise. And he fell for it in the heat of battle. And when you're in a campaign, it's not just yourself you're representing. You're, all these people are working for you. Uh, a whole movement has arisen beneath you. You don't want to let them down by losing. Uh, and so I don't think he ever had what a lot of politicians have is the fear of failure, but I think he had a sense of responsibility for the team. And so he, w he went along against his best instincts, and he had trouble living with himself after that. And so going back and, and 
correcting the mistakes he made about the Confederate flag in South Carolina was an act of penance that uh, I can't think of another example. You know, in 2000, I, I got an invite somehow to uh, it's to his birthday party, and I thought, oh, great, I'll, I'll uh, it's great. He's invited some journalists to his party, and so I go to a restaurant on the Upper East Side in New York, and I open the door and I walk in, and he hasn't invited a couple of journalists to his party. Everybody in there was a journalist. It was like Dan Rather, William Sapphire, like Charlie Rose, Chris Matthews, like every big name journalist in America was in that room. And that was the base. <laughs> and that was part politics. Uh, and it was just part who we liked hanging around with. The journalists can be, believe it or not, sort of fun to be around. And there's some of the people who are hanging around that campaign on the journalistic side, Michael Lewis I'm thinking of, are just great to be around, super fun. And so I think he really, he, I mean, one of the secrets about McCain is POW or not POW, he was always the most fun guy in the room. He always wanted to take you places and ha just have an adventure every single day. And so the campaign in 2000 was very much media-based. The campaign in 2008 was the opposite. And to me, the pivotal moment was my newspaper wrote a story that frankly was not adequately sourced and explored, sort of making the allegations that he had had an affair, but without really nailing it down. Uh, and that particular story did not re redound well on the New York Times, but I think McCain took a very personally, like I've been friends to all these people and now look how they're treating me. And so we were, we were out. And so if the media was very much in McCain world in 2000, we were the enemy by 2008. And so his attitude toward us had changed. And so the campaign become much, much more opaque and ideologically he became much more normal Republican. Uh, and there are times when McCain was not completely recognizable in that campaign. And then when I was with him in those days, every question was about Barack Obama. <laughs> and I could see him, he would get riled up that, uh, you know, it's all about this other guy. But, you know, what about me? I'm the maverick. Uh, and so it, it was, the whole tone was incredibly different from 2000 to 2008. Yeah, I, I think the media fell in love with Barack Obama and, you know, myself included. So. Uh, but in some ways, in 2008, the McCain story was even more dramatic because he really was dead in the water in the beginning of that primary campaign. And he just worked his way through town hall after town hall and won the thing on the, on the back of, A, just sheer hustle, but B, his ability to actually connect to people. Uh, and he could be a, a, a good speech maker, that's for sure, but he could be an amazing town hall performer. Uh, and he would rally people in small groups. And in some ways that was as impressive, just a political feat of connecting to voters uh, as you could imagine. I think what happened to McCain in 2000 and Obama in 2008 were exceptional where the media really was uh, bewitched by a candidate. And so I think what happened after that in both candidates' cases actually is that our coverage returned to normal. And it's annoying, our coverage is annoying because we're trying to tell the truth as we see it. It's never quite the truth as the candidate and the campaign sees it. So it's just always gonna be annoying. Uh, and I think if you react to it at, with hostility, you end up making it worse. Uh, and that's a little what happened in 2008. The big moment for me in 2008 was the, at the convention when he picked Palin. And I still was buddies with a lot of people in McCain world, and they split very quickly. And some of the people were um, deeply disillusioned immediately. They knew exactly what he had done, why he had done it, uh, and they were very disillusioned, and you began to see feuds. And a McCain campaign was never going to be an organized General Electric IBM operation. It was going to be controlled chaos. But I think in the pressure of that selection and then in the bigness of a campaign, it got to be chaos cubed. And some of the people there were infighting with others, people were getting fired. And by the end of the campaign, you know, I, I think a lot of us looked at the chaos we were hearing about within the campaign thinking, can this guy run a White House? Uh, and so uh, I think the, the bad blood um, within the campaign just got, um, just got pretty bad. <laughs> you know, politics is about serving and uh, 
you can't serve if you don't win. And he was behind. It was a, it was a long shot. And so he could justify the pick by saying, I had to th Hail Mary pass. I had to try something. I think, and I don't think he could have known this at the time. Frankly, the research wasn't thorough enough. But in picking Sarah Palin, he basically took a disease that was running through the Republican Party, not Palin herself, she's a normal human being, but a disease that I'll call anti-intellectualism, uh, disrespect for facts, um, and he put it right at the center of the party. Uh, and so she was a chapter in the rise of a cheap kind of populism that has since borne fruit in Donald Trump. But would we have Donald Trump without Sarah Palin? I'm not sure. She was certainly a step on the path to Donald Trump. Like every professional, only more so, politics has its own character challenges. Uh, one of the character challenges is that um, people are sucking up to you all the time. Another character challenge is there are other people who have think differently than you, and you've got to try to cobble together 50% of them. And you've got to try to do that every single day. And so, of course, you make compromises, but show me a profession where you don't make compromises. That's what life is like. And did McCain make some compromises to try to win the election? Of course, but he thought he was going to be able to run a really good foreign policy and a much better domestic policy. And, you know, I talk to politicians every day and they say, you don't, you don't win, you don't serve. And so you do what you have to do and you try not to totally render yourself unrecognizable in that process. And I would say McCain compromised in 2008. And he compromised in 2000, by the way. Uh, he never rendered himself unrecognizable. He was still essentially true to his core values and with moments here or there in the whole course of his campaign, the banking scandal, the South Carolina flag, Sarah Palin, he had, there are stains on his record. But there are pretty few stains given a very long record and a long set of examples of times where he easily could have compromised and it was totally would have benefited him uh, and he didn't go long. Yeah, I, I, as I say, um, what is it, where does a conscience come from? I think it comes from sort of the witness of the dead. The people he served with, his father, I think those voices are still in his head saying, no, this is the right action here. And he doesn't always listen to them, but he never can quite silence them. Uh, and he is a person, he's a weird mixture of someone who is a bad boy who wants to have fun, wants to go gambling, play craps. But he's also um, a very noble, magnanimous man who wants to be a great public servant. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty odd combination. I think McCain has, has told the American story uh, in a way that we needed to hear. One of the things that's jarring about him when I think about him is it always shocks me that, oh, he fought in Vietnam. I always think, oh, he fought in World War II, right? because he seems like a World War II type. And that's partly because he missed the 60s, he was in prison, but partly because he represents an ideal of soldier statesmen that we are more familiar with in World War II, with the George Marshalls, the Dwight Eisenhowers. Uh, and we're familiar with those men who are very masculine men, very strong men, uh, and who say, hey, I wasn't born blank slate into the world, and what can the world do for me? I was born very fortunate into a specific country. I owe, I owe a specific institution, the U.S. Navy, my service. It defines the standards by which I will live. I will try to serve, and then I'll try to pass it along to somebody in slightly better shape than I received it. And that sort of institutional mindset, the love of America, the love of what America represents, and the way patriotism can, sometimes it can be a very uh, tribal emotion, but sometimes it can be a very uplifting emotion. And the stories McCain tells about America are the uplifting stories, the immigrant stories, the soldier stories, uh, the pilot stories, uh, and they're meant to uplift it and tie us to one country. And in a moment when we're bifurcating and splitting up six ways from Sunday by ethnic lines, by political lines, that was never part of him because the American identity was always going to be stronger than the any ethnic identity, even an Arizona identity, uh, he was a nationalist in the best way.
Uh, he's just the most fun person to be around. Uh, I remember once he went, to, somebody was making a movie about his time in prison. And we went down to New Orleans and they set up a mock Hanoi Hilton. And he toured it with a, one of his prisoner buddies, a Medal of Honor winner named Bud Day. And we walk onto the set and there are all these Vietnamese guys dressed in prisoner uniforms, or prison guard uniforms. So suddenly you see McCain walking into what looked exactly like the Hanoi Hilton, surrounded by Vietnamese guys looking like guards. And Bud Day was, whoa, I'm back here. Uh, and McCain was not phased. He was like, mm, this is weird. And, and we walked through it. He was like very nice to the guards, signing all the autographs and all this kind of stuff. And then he took me to a casino. And he, uh, he taught me how to shoot craps. <laughs> and because it was him picking all the, um, the numbers, I won. I won like 300 bucks. And so I have these chips. And we're walking out of the casino. And there's a line where you cash in your chips. And McCain is a very impatient man. So he said, let's go. So I walked out of that casino with all my chips. I never got my money. And so that burst of like a nice life, but really wanting to have fun all the time, liking sports, liking gambling. Uh, liking buddies, telling stories, uh, just a, the most fun in the, the room every time I've been in the room with him. Yeah, McCain was among those most uh, vociferous in argument uh, for going to war in Iraq. And I think he did it um, for the same reasons I did it. Uh, I think he mostly did it because uh, he thought the Middle East could not survive filled with fundamentalism and dictatorship and that the path to a peaceful world was to try to introduce democracy uh, through that part of the world. And you have to remember the moment we had just been through the Cold War and had emerged triumphant from that war, and we'd seen democracy miraculously take off um, in this former Soviet Union, in South Africa, across the world. And this seemed like the final frontier of tyranny. And so I, I, when I would see him make the case for war, uh, and I was with him with a lot of his advisors who supported the war. That was primarily the argument. I, I recall it being a high-minded argument. And what I also recall is that he understood very quickly that some people in the Bush administration, notably Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, did not share that rationale for war, did not envision democracy promotion. And so he very early on, I, even in the first sweep of supposed victory, I think he understood that this need to be done a different way, and you began to see lobbying against Rumsfeld's vision of just get in and get out. And so, you know, you can mark a debit in McCain's column for supporting the war, it was a mistake. But he gets the asterisk that I think he would have fought it very differently, and he would have really understood the, the burden of democracy building in another place more than the Bush administration did. Campaign finance reform made him very unpopular in the conservative movement. Um, uh, George Will, a prominent, one of the most prominent conservative columnists, probably wrote 100 columns on why this was a terrible mistake. And in part, people thought, you know, money is speech, and partly it was principled, but partly they thought McCain was sucking up to the East Coast elites, and they love campaign finance reform. And it was on that issue and on global warming and a few others that they thought McCain's not really on the team. And that's sort of true. McCain's not a, just a team player in that way. Um, but I'm not sure he was uh, for campaign finance reform because it was beloved at the New York Times editorial page. I really don't think he cared. Uh, he was for it because he'd had a little bout of corruption scandal in his own life. Uh, and he was driven, wherever he saw stain, uh, he was driven to go after it, and he loved going after Stain. It was, it was he would, why he would wake up in the morning. There's some corruption here. Somebody's lying there. His politics were not ideological a lot of the time. They were more like a prosecutor a lot of the time. I once almost wrote a book, I wish I'd done it, on the second floor of the Russell Senate office building. And on that floor, Lindsey Graham had his office, Chuck Hagel had his office, Joe Biden had his office, um, uh, McCain had his office. And these were senators who sometimes fought with each other, but had a great sense of camaraderie with each other. A couple of them had fought. Biden and McCain had been in the Senate forever. And the sense of love of the institution uh, and the, the weird practices of the institution 
was something that I think all the people on that floor had, that this is just a great body and that we've inherited this thing that goes back 200 years uh, and it has weird peculiarities to it, but um, it's really what makes our democracy great. And what I saw McCain repelling again and again, though it's been a losing battle, is making the Senate more like the House. The House is a more ideological place, it's a more raucous place, it's a more leadership-driven place, and everything goes a lot faster there. And the Senate used to be very different, and now it's very much the same, with the same level of partisan fighting, uh, the a shortage now of really bipartisan friendship. And McCain loved, came of age in the old Senate, and I think has always loved the old Senate and uh, is less happy in, in what the Senate has become. One of the things I always loved seeing during the campaign was his treatment of immigrants. Uh, and America had a story which was an exodus story, which is that we were a people who escaped oppression, crossed the wilderness, and are trying to build a promised land. And that was the story the Puritans used to tell. That was a story that every immigrant group could accept. Yeah, that feels like my story. That was the story that Martin Luther King told, uh, Exodus. Uh, and I think that was the story he was raised with. And what's happened over the last 15 years is we've lost that story. Either we're not proud of our country in the way we were, we don't know biblical history, so we don't know shape the story. So it's been replaced by a lot of different stories. There's the libertarian story, which is we're all rugged individualists, if government get away from us. There's the, the tech story, which is that we're global disruptors in a global economy and we love disruption. There's the multicultural story, we're all in our own groups. And there's the Donald Trump story, which was that we're honest peasants in the heartland who are being attacked by outsiders. And so the story that McCain told all his life is a story that's not known anymore. And without a coherent national story, well, you don't have a coherent country in a country as diverse as ours. I thought this was McCain's great moment in the twilight of his career because the Steve Bannons of the world and the Donald Trumps of the world know what they believe. Uh, they um, have a belief that America is under assault from Muslims, from immigrants, from cultural elites, uh, and they want to build walls to protect America from all those things. And what bothered me about the rest of the Republican Party is they didn't buy that story, but they didn't have another story. They didn't have the conviction to tell a different story uh, or the courage to really be clear that they don't believe Trump's story. And so McCain's uh, Constitutional Center speech was the first time somebody said, no, uh, we're going to lay down a gauntlet here that we're for openness, that we're for some sort of disciplined immigration. Uh, we're going to promote the democracy around the world and try to create a post-war order the way we always have uh, in a new century. And so to me, that was the moment that other Republicans can say, yeah, I, I, that's actually what I believe. And you then saw George W. Bush come out with a speech, and I think Mitt Romney got a little emboldened, Colin Powell. And so it was somebody finally telling the opposite story. And to me, the big, the big contrast between what John McCain believes and what the current Republican Party is concerns the post-war international order. He's primarily a foreign policy thinker. And he grew up with NATO, uh, with the post-war order. And this was the idea that America creates a global order within which all nations can thrive. And we use international organizations as a way to leverage our power even more. And Trump rejects that. The tearing down that war, post-war order is part of his project. And so that's a pretty fundamental difference from the thing that John McCain has spent his whole life defending and building. His public service has been so deeply entwined with friendships. And a lot of the friendships have been with Democrats, Ted Kennedy, Joe Biden. Uh, he loved Mo Morris Udall, who was a Democratic member of the House who ran for president back in the 70s, and he quotes Udall all the time. Um, and so out of that sense of friendship came a belief that party was not everything. Uh, and out of that sense of his own past came a direct experience with crafting compromised legislation. And sometimes it was done through committees, and sometimes it was done through gangs, the Gang of Eights, and they were bipartisan. 
And there was a sense the other half of the country exists, you got to deal with them. And so he would craft a compromise general bill on immigration reform. Uh, and it wasn't filled with everything he loved, but it was an act of politics. And what he had seen was a group of people like Ted Cruz come in and say, we don't need to compromise, it's gonna be, we're going to get 100% what they want, and we can blow up the institution in order to get it. And I think that just was an insult to his whole life's work. And so when he came back, he insisted on, hey, you know, maybe before we pass a piece of legislation, we should hold some hearings about it. Like, it would seem like this is nursery school level. Like, you go to the doctor, I'm going to operate, and then I'll have a diagnosis. No, maybe you should do the diagnosis first. Like, this is not complicated stuff here. But he stated the obvious. Uh, and not only did he state it, but when the health care thing came up for the vote, it was a pretty, there have been a lot of dramatic moments in McCain's career, but doing the thumbs down on that vote, uh, he did it so quickly and so decisively, and like it was not a big deal, but it was heard around Washington, and it made him a lot of enemies. Uh, but I think it was a good service to the country. Whatever you think of the bill, it, you shouldn't pass major legislation the way they were doing it. Well, Trump is, uh, has taken the Republican Party and turned it on its head uh, in its views of foreign affairs. Um, McCain is an internationalist. Trump is a nationalist. In its views of cultivating a leadership class, uh, McCain believes in that. He went to, you know, went to the Naval Academy has is friends with a lot of people who are members of the leadership class. And the quality of that class can rise and fall, and it's been falling, and Trump is against that. And so Trump comes in at a time when the party is uh, unrecognizable to the, probably to the John McCain of 1985 or 1990. Uh, this was a guy who grew up with Reagan, and what Trump signifies is the end of the Reagan era. You know, the classical Greeks used to argue that the way we teach how to behave is through example. That we sort of publish the book of our lives by all our actions every day. And we, the other people look at us and they approve or disapprove, but they get a sense of, yeah, that's how I should behave. And that's how I shouldn't behave. And this is especially powerful among our public servants. That if you're president, you should try to tell the truth. If you're Barack Obama, Try to show how good family life looks like, even in uh, hard times and you know busy times. If you're John McCain and you see corruption in your own party, go after that corruption. Don't put party among, come above, above country. And so, to me, McCain more than anything else, he was a good legislator, but he is especially good teacher, and he taught by example. Some of it he wrote books on courage and things like that, but partly he just inspired people by behavior of his example. And that was example uh, in Vietnam. Uh, but it was example after on the campaign trail. You know, I talked to him a lot about Vietnam back in 2000. And I got the sense he was a little bored by it. <laughs> he knew the, what had happened there was a great political benefit to him. But he was more interested in telling other people's stories. And um, he was more interested in, frankly, immigrant stories and rags to riches stories. And so those campaigns were not successful in 2000, but I think it was a great education to the country of what a certain side of a leader could look like. Well, it's, a, it's beyond one person to fix what's happened to our politics. But if he stands up and tells um, the truth as he sees it, I think that will encourage others. Because if they see the story that, um, say, Donald Trump tells, and then they see the story that John McCain tells, they're going to be reminded of who they are. It's very easy to abstract away from yourself in politics. The climate is so strong, the pressures are so strong, you can lose your inner voice. And if Pete McCain can remind a lot of the members of Congress who really believe in, in what he believes in fundamentally, that, yeah, yeah, that is what I believe, I forgot about that, then I think he can have a powerful influence on the people around him, even if it's not about passing legislation or not about you know, taking down this or that presidency. Yeah, I think McCain, since his diagnosis, has found his regular voice. You know, when you're in a POW camp for five years, everything that comes after that is great. You, you face death, uh, and you've probably assumed you were going to die. And so everything that comes after that is not about me, but about telling the truth and about country. 
And so I think one of the reasons he was so candid through life is because he'd already had the death diagnosis and somehow he miraculously escaped it. And that had to be why he, he had the solid solidity to be the kind of senator he was. And so now with another death diagnosis, uh, he just reminds me of himself more than ever. He doesn't seem like a transformed person to me. He just reminds me of, oh yeah, that was John McCain 2000. That's the same guy. One of the things that I've always thought drives him is that core POW experience and being loyal to, loyal to that experience when he learned in that experience. So the first thing I remember, we used to have, there's all these POW MIA flags that are up and there used to be organizations that would tell the families of those missing in Vietnam, oh, they're still alive. And he thought that was so cruel. And I remember his disgust at some of the organizations that were claiming they were still there because he thought it was wrong for the families. And then when in the middle of the Iraq war, it turned out the CIA had loosened their standards on what you could do to prisoners, I think that brought him back to this kernel experience of his life and that torture was wrong, it's always gonna be wrong. It was wrong when they did it, I experienced it, and it's doubly wrong when we do it. And so those moments, anything that ties back to that, that really making of him experience in life, that transformed him from being just a wild boy to a wild boy with sobriety and, and a purpose, um, that will be, and it'd be fitting, frankly, if the key experience of his life, which happened in the 1960s was related to the crowning experience of his life, which was getting a good torture policy and getting accountability on torture. Uh, that happened, you know, four, four decades later. I remember being in New Hampshire, and I remember the, um, I don't know if it was an image, but it captured the moment. It was a picture of McCain with a lightsaber from Star Wars. And it was, uh, it was, he was Han Solo on that night. Uh, he was triumphant, a uh, warrior uh, against the party establishment. Um, and it, it was like, it was, the only thing I've seen like it is, is Obama winning Iowa in 2008. Those are the two moments in my political life where all idealism was justified. And cynicism fell away from politics because somebody who truly believed in something, somebody who could um, express what the country wanted to hear and the best elements of what the country wanted to hear, that person had won and had won in the best possible way. That does not happen every day in politics.